Welcome to the Canadian Urban Transit Association's New Mobility Symposium. For those of you that have been following the changes in our organization in the past few years, you know that we are more than a transit advocacy group. We strive to be champions in complete integrated urban mobility solutions, which is what brings us here today. We're really excited about the people we have in the room today, representing not only transit systems across the country, but planners, elected officials, and technology experts from the transportation sector. It's also appropriate that we are partnering with TransLink on this day, and not just because they are one of the leaders on the discussion about integrated urban mobility, but also because the way the province has approached the question of ride hailing. Where other communities in Canada have chosen to either welcome transportation network companies, TNCs, into cities with minimal regulation, or regulate them out of cities entirely, BC has chosen to take an evidence-based approach to the discussion, striking a panel, and then reporting back to leaders on what next steps should be. And that is what today is about. We want to provide Canadian audience evidence about the role TNCs can play in the integrated urban mobility mix that you just won't find anywhere else in Canada. As you know, we'll be starting the day with a number of examples of TNCs themselves and their success stories with transit in Canada and elsewhere. After that, we're going to, tell, we're going to hear what the data tells us about the impact of TNCs and transit. And the data doesn't always agree. So we're going to have to listen critically to what we're hearing while at the same time keeping an open mind to the evidence. Next, we're going to hear about some exciting innovations in mobility as a service from Europe. If TNCs are really going to have a fully integrated role in urban mobility, many people think this is the tool that will make it happen. Then, we're going to hear from technologi technological innovators in urban mobility, from as close as right here in the Lower Mainland to as far away as Ireland and India. Finally, we're going to ask our moderators to come back on stage. And they're going to sum up what they've heard so that you can go away with some really practical ideas and some good knowledge to guide decisions in your next steps in your transit systems and in your communities. Before all that, though, we're going to hear from our partner in this event, TransLink, and I'd like to introduce Kevin Desmond. Great, great, great. I have more to say. <laughs> I have more to say. Uh, Kevin is an experienced executive with a career built in public transportation industry. Prior to joining TransLink, Kevin was general manager of King County Metro Transit, serving the Seattle metropolitan region. At Metro, he oversaw a mix of transit modes, including buses, trains, van pools, paratransit vans, as well as approximately 5,000 employees. In his 12-year tenure, he helped grow ridership 44% and launched the Orca card, as well as light rail, streetcar service, and several bus rapid transit lines. Kevin was also part of three successful votes on transit funding. Prior to Metro Transit, Kevin was Vice President of Operations and Development at Pierce Transit in Tacoma, Washington. Before relocating to the West Coast, he acted as Chief of Operations Planning for New York City Transit, which includes bus and subway operations. And earlier in his career, he served as Deputy Director in Mayor Cox Transportation Office and Assistant Commissioner for the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Please welcome Kevin Desmond. Thank you, Wendy, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. We, uh, for this conference, we finally brought the rain back after uh, uh, over a month of, of, of beautiful weather, so that means there's no reason for you to leave today, and you, you can stay uh, uh, stay throughout uh, the, the conference. As you heard from Wendy, uh, I think it's a great program and um, I am so, so pleased and proud, frankly, that CUDA uh, chose Vancouver um, to have this, this event uh, today and, and, and we're beating our good friends at APTA by a little over a month with their, their mobility conference in Washington, D.C. I'm not a competitive person, as my staff knows, <laughs> but you know, it's nice to be first and, and uh, along the way. But, uh, I think it's a great gathering of, of folks today, and I, I think it's absolutely terrific uh, agenda, and I think the format as well 
um, uh, of this symposium really will allow for a lot of, um, lot of good conversation. Uh, and I think it's, a, it's fitting that, that this conference is here in, in Vancouver, because for one thing, we have a very, very strong uh, transit uh, tradition in this region, and as I think many of you know, a very, very progressive approach uh, to uh, land use planning. Uh, which those things go together, and that, that's so very important to the, uh, those of us in the transit industry and that linkage between um, good land use planning and, and transit uh, planning. This is also a very tech-savvy region of, of Canada. It's a very tech-savvy region uh, of North America, the Pacific Northwest. So again, um, another great reason um, that we're here. Um, a recent study by uh, Van City um, here um, showed that we're, one of, we're the car sharing capital of the world, at least on a per capita basis. So whether that's actually accurate or not, it certainly demonstrates, <laughs> it certainly demonstrates that, that the people of this region are, will use public transportation if we put out a good product, will use um, shared cars, shared bikes, and so on and so forth. So if and how TNCs eventually come to our region, that will add to the, to the environment. It's an issue, of course, we have to um, deal with. Um, we've also recently learned a number of days ago that <coughs> Vancouver and Surrey uh, were shortlisted for the Canadian Smart Cities uh, competition. I think uh, we were one of the five uh, metropolitan regions, large metropolitan regions shortlisted. So a lot of eagerness to get into the game and, and the Surrey and Vancouver uh, proposal was focused on transportation. So how do we start thinking of AVs uh, in our system is coming forward. Just a couple weeks ago, we launched our tap to pay program here, and I've already spoken to folks uh, this morning that you can just use your credit card or your NFC-enabled uh, mobile wallet right on our system. It was built into our Compass system, so many of you here today are visitors to the system, so if you've used SkyTrain or even the buses and you don't have a Compass product, just try your credit card, or, or if you've got a mobile wallet, uh, you can, you're good to go with, with the system. <clears throat> Something like about 5,500 uh, individual taps a day we're averaging so far, so we're extremely pleased uh, with how that's, um, how that's working. And of course, you know, AVs, it's on, you know, everybody's thinking about AVs a lot. Let's just remember we've been doing AVs for 30 years here. So we're way ahead of the curve uh, with our automated SkyTrain system. And then finally, there'll be a lot of conversation, certainly from the TransLink staff uh, that are here during the course of the day. We're entering the new mobility space. We know that that's the future. We want to help uh, try to facilitate that um, uh, those innovations within our own system, working very, very closely with our partners uh, in the private sector and elsewhere uh, in government. <clears throat> so as CUDA was um, uh, promoting this conference, <clears throat> they, you know, they had this on the, the website as the way to um, uh, promote, you know, the end of transit. Sure, a very um, provocative statement. Good to see that they use San Francisco Muni as the buses and not our buses here uh, <clears throat> in Vancouver. Um, well, you know, I, I'll say an absolute no. It's not the end of transit. Um, I don't foresee that, certainly in this, in this industry, as anywhere, <clears throat> even in the near-term future. Um, the, the ride sharing, the shared economy, TNCs, all that stuff, even AVs, they're not going to replace uh, the intrinsic value of high-capacity transit. They just can't. You can't move people that, that quickly. <clears throat> That's not to say, of course, that the landscape is not going to change, and we've got to be very much aware of that. Excuse me. <clears throat> so again, that's one of the values of this conference, and I, I applaud CUDA, in fact, uh, for using this as the hook uh, for the conference, because at least those of us in the business, we don't want to see the end of public transit. We want to see mobility. We want to maximize the choices that people have, with public transit still being a very, very important element, but just one of many, many different elements. <clears throat> so during the course of this conference, you'll be exploring uh, the mix of, of transit and the shared uh, services and how to integrate how to integrate the public, the old-fashioned publicly supported public transportation systems with these new private sector um, and shared um, uh, services. What's the impact on urban planning of these, of, of these new services? What's the impact on traffic congestion um, of these new uh, services? And of course, when we finally see the, the, the coming of automated vehicles, how is that going to change um, our environment and how can we prepare uh, as best as possible for it? 
So just a few minutes for those of you who are uh, visitors to, <clears throat> to our region, a little bit about uh, TransLink. We're an integrated, multimodal organization. We try to do a lot in the region, from just running conventional bus service, SkyTrain, our handy dart service for people with disabilities, our sea bus service connecting Vancouver uh, to the North Shore, commuter rail, all the way to managing areas, uh, elements of the arterial road network, our major road uh, network here in the system, <clears throat> managing some bridges, um, but also being a very, very, uh, the region, region's transportation planner. We have a huge amount and capability to do transportation planning and data analysis uh, in the region. And that's, that's something that we want to increasingly leverage uh, the power of TransLink to support this region's um, uh, further, <coughs> further development. So it's, it's really, it's, we're in an ideal position here um, in our region to help support the overall approach to transportation planning and delivery uh, going forward. And it's, it's a fascinating time here, frankly, uh, in our region uh, to be thinking about that. Uh, one thing that you probably know, those of you from Toronto see this, those of you from the Bay Area, for example, see this, even in Seattle now, housing affordability is a major, major, is the number one public issue here probably. And how we help support that, how we see a linkage between affordable housing and access to jobs and transportation is a real driving force to our system and is helping, frankly, support um, locally in the public, taxpayers, uh, the desire to improve public transportation um, here in our region. So we're, we're busy uh, working on, on extending the system. This is in part a map, uh, a little bit of today uh, and the future. The SkyTrain network, existing B-line services, which are, you might call them our proto um, BRT, arterial BRT uh, corridors, and the extension of our system. We're working on a $7.5 billion program uh, to get it fully funded, hopefully over the next month or two, uh, with the province and the federal government to, to expand um, our Millennium Line um, into the most densely um, uh, traveled corridor, bus corridor uh, in the region, starting to bring light rail uh, to the city of Surrey and eventually 27 kilometers of light rail and improve our B-Line from basically just limited stop um, frequent service to something more like arterial BRT. We call it um, B-Line or better. All of this is supporting right now about 407 million um, transit trips a year. That was our number last year. It was our, our second straight uh, record year. Um, we're now in our third year of pretty astonishing ridership growth uh, in this region. Last year, we led North America, or at least Canada in the United States, by a large margin in ridership growth, 5.7% increase. And so far this year, we're trending at about a 6% ridership increase. So something is happening here. Some of that has to do with the service improvements that we've made um, over the last year. We put a lot of new bus service out, improved SkyTrain service, uh, and so forth. Our Compass uh, system, I'm convinced, has helped generate additional market share for us, additional ridership, because we've improved the convenience of the system. That's why the tap to pay, I think, is going to take us to a new level uh, as well. And of course, our high gas prices. We've got the highest gas prices possibly in, in North America, although I heard on the radio uh, this morning that the high gas prices are starting to move um, east in Canada um, as well. Uh, so we're on the move here, we're making things happen, um, and that's why we've got to embrace change um, and innovation. One of the things I want to mention, um, and if you're visitors here and you have a chance to get out on the SkyTrain uh, network, is the TOD, the transit-oriented development in this region. You know, I'm from, uh, most recently, from the Seattle area, and, and we would always look to uh, the Vancouver region to come up and visit Vancouver to try to understand how and why so much density around the SkyTrain network. This image really just pictorially shows a lot of the projects uh, around portions of the SkyTrain um, Sky network and then a, uh, a, an artist's rendition of a major project along um, SkyTrain. It's driving ridership and it's, it's very much connected to the land use planning um, in, the, in the region. And I think it has implications, certainly, for the future of mobility. If you've got so much density around those high capacity transit nodes that provide access um, throughout the region, how does that affect the shared economy? How does that affect our ability to provide mobility in the future? Whether it's in the dense urban areas, and as we'll talk about in a little while, uh, as well to the less dense um, part of our network. So transitioning to, to what we're doing in the new mobility space, we've kind of branded what we're up to uh, TransLink um, tomorrow. Um, this is our desire to um, 
integrate many, many of um, these different types of mobility service, services into a common um, place where we can ultimately start transitioning from sort of balkanized types of services to a combined overall single way to optimize your travel planning, optimize uh, your travel payment, optimize the information that people so uh, want to demand um, to travel uh, efficiently in the system. So um, this program, we, we began to launch it uh, last year. We did a, a symposium um, in, in, in Vancouver. Uh, we brought a lot of folks from the public and private sector um, together to sort of think about how we prioritize going forward, what we want to be, um, uh, what we want to be uh, working on. Now, what that also meant behind the scenes, so those of you from a public transit um, organization, behind the scenes, we need to spend some time to figure out what policy basis do we want to use behind the scenes to help support and govern how we might want to do open innovation calls, how we might want to, almost from an investment banking standpoint, put some public dollars forward to help incent the private sector entrepreneurs or that you know, prototypical 17-year-old in shorts in the um, garage coming up with some brilliant um, app. Where do we get the funding for that? Our 10-year plan, that the, the mayor's, uh, our mayor's 10-year plan, part of the transit expansion, we squirreled aside some money, actual dollars in the budget, to help us um, um, support some of these um, innovative programs um, going forward. And this is really what TransLink Tomorrow is about, having policy basis, having a governance approach, and having some money behind our ability uh, to incent um, innovation. So just last week, uh, probably the, the, our first round, uh, we, we issued an op open innovation call. Uh, and this is where we want to start, we're going to test um, how we do it. In uh, some regions, they're, they're unsolicited proposals, we'll call it um, an open innovation um, call where we can try to understand how best to collaborate uh, with industry. Now, what, as I said, we did a, a symposium um, last fall um, in Vancouver and based on a lot of the conversation um, around the table, we were trying to get, get a sense of what should we focus on first at TransLink for our TransLink Tomorrow program and the open innovation call. And it really came around something, you know, seamless mobility. You know, seamless mobility, what's that about? Well, frankly, it's what's going to be talked about all day here uh, at this, this conference. There's lots of TransLink staff here that you can speak to about the open um, innovation call. And I certainly expect during breaks you'll have the chance to do that and even during um, some of the, uh, some of the uh, panels themselves. And as a part of those, the, the open innovation call, we, we need to not only understand what kind of product might be out there, it might be the winning product that we might want to help in, invest in, but through that, we're also going to learn and better understand some of the challenges of ultimately creating this seamless mobility, you know, whether it's a, some sing, uh, outside platform, a third-party platform to bring everything together, a hosted platform maybe by TransLink. What are the issues, unresolved issues around data sharing? governance of the information. How do you, how do you, you, you have a clearinghouse for revenues and how do you redistribute uh, revenues fairly <coughs> for all the partners if you're trying to do a common, common ticketing? Uh, new business models and, and partnerships. Who are the service providers that might um, join this type of, of app? Do we need legislation? Are there legislative issues, um, uh, public issues that we've got to uh, consider um, as well? These are the types of things I think it's, it's a petri dish of how to deal with, with these very um, persnickety public policy issues. And I think everyone in the room has been thinking of things uh, like, like that going forward. But we are committed uh, to offering the funding, some funding to help make this happen, to help incubate really good ideas. Now, in addition to the open innovation call, eventually we also want to figure out ways to um, further share our data. Uh, TransLink, I think this first in Canada and one of the first in, in North America. Uh, to open source its, its information some 10 years ago um, or, 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 or so. Uh, we want to continue to find ways to make our data available. We have an enormous amount of data now available through our Compass program uh, for, for, to help analyze how people are moving around um, uh, as it were. So data sharing, as well maybe offering our services and operations as, as places where products, we can experiment with products internally and test products and see if they might be market ready. This is all part of our TransLink Tomorrow uh, program. Now, of course, Wendy mentioned uh, uh, ride hailing is not legal yet uh, in BC. And it's something that was, frankly, it was a campaign issue 
last year in the provincial elections here. And uh, the Green Party was very gung-ho. We, we need to uh, move on ride-hailing very quickly. Uh, the government, that, that uh, the NDP party that eventually has, um, uh, is, is managing the government now has said it will move uh, with legislation. So we're all waiting uh, for that legislation, maybe in the fall. It's inevitable. It is coming. Uh, so we certainly, I know that Uber and Lyft are here and, and others. Uh, so, we, you know, they're coming. And we need to figure out um, how to embrace those services and how to make sure that they integrate well with the existing publicly supported public transportation um, system. I know some of the discussion um, today will be about, you know, when TNCs come and ride hailing, does that help undermine transit ridership? And there's evidence in some cities that that may be the case and that that's going to be some of the conversation today. You know, but where I came from in Seattle, uh, where we had um, the TNCs and they're a very active space, Seattle ridership's been growing as well. So it really, I think, it all depends on the environment in which these new services um, land. For us, you know, the, the, the probably four main considerations we have uh, for the TNCs uh, when they come that we want to be very mindful of. We'd like to see that in, in the legislation in some form or another, but we also want to see that in the behaviors um, of, of the TNCs. Um, first and foremost, we embrace more mobility choices. So we do embrace the TNCs coming, the ride hailing um, coming. So that's, that's a given for us. Um, number two, we want to make sure that they complement the public transportation system and not duplicate it and, in a sense, unfairly or ruinously compete with it. So how do you figure out that way of, of a mutual, uh, mutually beneficial um, outcome? Uh, we need to make sure that it doesn't make traffic worse. That would be a bad outcome. If for any other reason our buses ride on the, uh, operate on the same streets as general traffic, we don't want to see that um, undermine. And of course, that's ultimately contra uh, contrary to the, our overall mission here uh, at TransLink. And then fourthly, we want to we know how uh, the, the ride hailing companies can help mobility for people with disabilities um, as well. So broaden the accessibility for all of our citizens um, going forward. And I think there's evidence that the TNCs, at least in North America, are eager um, uh, to do that. We're also beginning to, to look at on-demand transit, microtransit. So whether it's a, a first mile, last mile solution, getting to our high capacity transit modes, nodes, or helping to provide better mobility in our rural areas or, or much lower density areas of our region. We have a very vast region that TransLink's responsible for. Uh, one of our, micro, our first microtransit uh, project is out on uh, beautiful Bowen Island, uh, and, uh, where they've got very limited uh, transit service. We think that's a good test bed uh, to, to play around with it. We're thinking as well to the south in the city of Langley and the township of Langley to try out some microtransit. So again, we want it, we, we're, we're testing the waters. We know it's coming. We know it can be a very, very important adjunct to our system. Uh, going forward. So that, that becomes a very valuable um, test bed uh, for us. So uh, I'll close with, with thinking about um, uh, the future. In addition to launching our $7.5 billion um, uh, trans major transit expansion phase, we're just now getting started with the renewal of our, of our long-range uh, plan. As I mentioned, ridership is booming here. We've got an afford housing affordability problem. We're a region with a very, very strong economy. We're also a gateway trade um, region. There's a huge desire to improve high capacity transit and, and transportation options in this region. And we really want to, we want to know how this community sees its next 10 year plan and the 10 year plan um, after that. But a, a significant portion of the long range plan is not just drawing lines on the map for the next SkyTrain extension or where perhaps we have more waterborne transportation or where we might take commuter rail and so on and so forth. But it is also looking at how these types of services, the shared services, are going to affect our landscape uh, going forward. So it's a very, very explicit part of our long range planning. So it's, it's thinking today, but also thinking what is 5, 10, 20 years down the road, and that's, of course, where automated vehicles play as well. I have no idea how automated vehicles are going to play out in our region. There's so many different points of view uh, and opinions. The proponents, the car, uh, the, the manufacturers of these systems um, believe it's tomorrow. They really want to push it. Others will say, well, you know, you could, you could create some really, really negative <clears throat> outcomes, all the way to driverless buses, and we have to be thinking about that what that might mean to transform our organization, what it means for jobs 
what it means for jobs. We, we have almost 4,000 transit operators uh, here in our company. What happened to those jobs? What will happen to those jobs going forward? So what is the just transition, if you will, uh, to an automated, automated future? These are all the sorts of things that we're going to be grappling with in the context of our long-range plan. So there's, a, there's plenty of TransLink staff here. You'll be able to circulate. Uh, they're, going to, they're going to absorb like sponges all of the information that you all will be talking about um, during the course of the day, and I hope you have a really, really great conference. So I'm giving you three minutes and 38 seconds extra time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.